Welcome back to Reading Bear. Today, we will take a look at some new Mauritius compliance stories. And if you enjoyed my content, please don't forget to subscribe to my channel and post some bear emojis in the comments. Let's go! The first one is titled, Merry Christmas on a Cup. That happened a few years ago, I'm fairly sure you'll remember how the war on Christmas was raging and some people thought they make a statement by demanding that the Starbucks employee writes Merry Christmas on their cup because then they would have to say Merry Christmas, which they allegedly must not say. Why is beyond me, but hey. Starbucks sure didn't complain since these people usually don't buy a coffee there and, well, any money is good money. Anyway. One of them came in and ordered the smallest, cheapest coffee they had and made a spectacle out of wanting it for Merry Christmas. He deflated a tiny bit when the barrister simply nodded and was absolutely unfazed. Obviously he wasn't the first one to order one, stood there and waited for a while until he was called for Merry. With a very obvious stress on this way of pronouncing it. There is more than a subtle difference between Merry and Mary, and this was very obviously Mary. The store was already snickering at this point and the guy went to the barrister who looked at him wide-eyed. You are Mary? It's Mary. Merry Christmas. The barrister looked down and muttered, my apologies, ma'am, it was absolutely not my intention to assume your gender. This is where the store lost it and the guy left. The next one is titled, Tis the Season. Once upon a time I was a newlywed, getting ready for my first Christmas with my in-laws. Now it's worth noting that these people are Christmas crazy, you know that one house on the block that's decked out in more bling than a cashed up stripper. That's them. So as a new bride I wanted to make a good impression. I should also note that my new husband had a history of taking credit for things he'd played no part in, such as presents, or meals. Or a wedding. In the lead up to Christmas I had shopped, wrapped and ribboned as if my life depended on it. Everyone had carefully selected gifts that were wrapped immaculately, with a complimenting ribbon and bow, and handmade tags, not the stickers with, to, and, from. Christmas morning, I was ready. We entered the living room, and after the momentary visual adjustment required for that amount of tinsel in a confined space everyone sat down around the tree for the gift-giving ceremony. The ceremony was a big part of the day for my in-laws, one person was selected to wear a Santa hat and distribute the gifts one by one. When it was your turn to open a gift, everybody watched you. What I didn't know then is this was a form of analysis so it could be discussed later. A few gifts are given out, then one of the ones I'd wrapped was handed to my husband. I was terribly excited, it was something he'd wanted for ages. I couldn't wait for him to be thrilled when he opened it. But wait I did, because he couldn't get the ribbon off. We weren't supposed to talk during the ceremony, so we all sat there quietly while a grown man wrestled with a ribbon. It was curling ribbon for those in the know, not exactly a Rubik's Cube. After a good 10 minutes of watching him lose his mind, I quietly suggested he pull the bow off so the ribbon would slip off the side. He did so, and was mildly enthused at the gift. We moved on to the next person, and after a bit my husband was handed another gift. My mother-in-law said, don't worry, I won't tell you how to open it. With a completely innocent smile on her face. I chose not to say what I was thinking. Shortly after, a gift was handed to me from my parents-in-law, with an insincere apology that it didn't have a bow. At this point I figured I must have somehow broken ceremony etiquette by using ribbon. I made a mental note not to repeat my mistake in the future and laughed it off. First Christmas, right? there's bound to be some hiccups. Following the ceremony it was lunchtime, which went fine. Afterwards the men retired downstairs while the women cleaned up. This wasn't unusual as they're a fairly traditional family. Except instead of helping my mother and sister-in-law with the dishes, I was sent to collect the scraps of wrapping paper from earlier and take them out to the rubbish. This was a little unusual, when I'd been there for meals before I'd done dishes with them. But again, it's Christmas and they have their rules. So I collected it all up, and then went back to the kitchen to get another rubbish bag. I was in the hallway, and I overheard their conversation about how utterly terrible I was at domestic things, how I'd clearly paid to have the gifts wrapped to show off, how the things I'd picked were unsuitable, and I was so ungrateful for what they'd given me etc etc. I was steamed. 
Unexpectedly, my husband chimed in. If I'd have known she was going to go stupid with it I would have helped, but I was so busy working and she swore she'd take care of it. I went from steam to apocalyptic. He was in his third week of an eight-week holiday from work, while I was working extra shifts trying to get a promotion. I had begged him to help me choose things for his family. When we got home later and I'd calmed down a bit, I tried talking to him about it. His response was a groveling apology and an explanation that his family were a bit crazy about Christmas and that I should just leave family gifts to him. So the following Christmas, I bought a gift for each of them. One gift. From me only. Wrapped with simple paper and minimal tape. Christmas morning comes around, and my husband is given the honor of the Santa hat. Halfway through he starts looking around the tree frantically, obviously having realized that there was nothing from him under there. Afterwards he pulls me aside and asks what the duck. I'm sure I looked way more innocent than I felt when I answered, I left the family gifts to you. I don't have a funny story about the third Christmas, because our marriage didn't last that long. But I've just finished wrapping a pile of gifts for this Christmas, and as I curled the ribbon to make my kids' presents extra fancy, I felt very vindicated to know that tomorrow morning's chaos will have zero sense of ceremony about it. Merry Christmas. Edit, I am really enjoying reading about everyone's wrapping traditions, and I'm pleased to say that the people around me now love my little creative quirks. Many of you have congratulated me on getting out of the situation but in the interests of accuracy, three months after the second Christmas my now ex-husband informed me during a romantic dinner that he wanted a divorce. I didn't see it coming and at the time I thought the world was ending, but now the whole relationship is a series of humorous anecdotes. Take heart if you're in a bad situation, there does come a time where you can laugh about it. The next one is titled, Delicious Compliance. This all happened about 10 years ago, so no harm done in telling the long tale. I used to be a suit for a large corporation and was in charge of a visitor center in the middle of nowhere, one hour away from the company's HQ. The visitor center was attached to a site where technology was prototyped or used for the first time, so many managers working in the same industry came by, had a tour and maybe some meetings with other suits from HQ. One of my tasks was to create the work plans for the other 25 tour guides. These were mostly smart students in their early 20s, doing this as a temp job one or two days a week. Most of them were trilingual, German, English plus X, and our guests were in awe when someone could do the tour in their native language like Russian, Hindi, Korean or Norwegian. Work was not too hard, if you liked talking, pay was very good, 20 euros per hour, plus commuting expense, and the guests were pleasant professionals, other students or people from our company. On a normal day, there were 7 to 10 guides and each did 4 to 5 tours. In my culture, gifts are not a big deal. You get something on your birthday and on Christmas and maybe bring some flowers when you visit your mother, but that's usually it. Since we had many international guests, I quickly learned that in many countries it seems to be normal to bring a really nice gift if you are a guest. So we trained all guides to properly handle this and not to offend anyone. Since most of our tour guests were from abroad, every tour guide would take at least one or two gifts home daily, ranging from chocolate to electronic gadgets or booze. We usually shared everything among the guides, but if you did the tour you had dibs if you really wanted the bottle of whiskey. The only unspoken rule was not to sell it. Some groups were so happy with the tour that they even sent a thank you package to one of the guides. So over the course of two years we had many thousand groups and even had a space in our storage for the gifts that nobody wanted. We called it the kitsch keist tacky stuff box. Then the company ducked up during the quarterly fiscal reports, the shareholders were angry and so they did what every other Fortune 500 company does, bullshit measures to get the board off your back. One of these measures was a program to ensure compliance. So someone was appointed CCO, Chief Compliance Officer, and in charge of making sure there is no bribery going on. A few weeks later every single employee received 60 pages of legal gibberish explaining what compliance means and what to do and what not. I actually read that contract before signing, because my tour guide temps would be spared to sign it if I took the responsibility. Unfortunately it also said something like, gifts above estimated value of 20 euros cannot be accepted. If you cannot guess the value they must also not be accepted. 
So I wrote to the compliance officer, told him about the visitor center and explained that it would be very rude to refuse a little gift from a Japanese guest. I just did everything by the books and asked for a suggestion what to do. He called me and was pretty angry that we had accepted all these gifts over the years but still had no clue that it can be offensive to refuse a gift. He said he will revise the compliance document and send me a new one. The new document said that all gifts of uncertain value or above 20 euros must be sent to the compliance officer, they will do a lottery and fairly give it to someone at HQ. I signed the new compliance guidelines and plotted my revenge. Of course my team was sad that the daily gifts were not to be taken home anymore, but they also knew that the CCO would tightly monitor our behavior because we were a potentially easy target. So we Germaned up and did everything in the formally most correct way. We ordered a few hundred boxes and package stamps company expenses and started to send 20 to 30 boxes to the CCO's office. Daily. We used the different tour guide names and addresses as senders and also used the crap from the kitsch keist. After three weeks I received another angry call from the CCO's assistant. He was abroad for the time with his boss and came back to a pile of boxes. I stated that it was exactly as he wanted it and if he had a better idea he should let me know. He suggested we should just store them somewhere and send them by bulk every month. Four weeks later we did just that and also added an inventory list of every single item. Then my boss did me a favor, went on the company intranet forums and asked what will happen to all these gifts, since the process seems pretty intransparent to him and that this is exactly the opposite of compliance. This produces so many replies that they felt pushed to make an official statement on the intranet and actually held this ducking tombola which the CCO's office had to organize. This got the attention from the advisory board and they asked the CCO if he had nothing better to do than to organize gift lotteries. Half a year later the guy was fired. We kept the gifts from this point on. Nobody asked ever again. The visitor center shut down in 2013 because the project ended. The next one is titled, Want us to decorate our office door for a Christmas contest? Sure, we'll participate. So, in the military, we sometimes have mandatory fun. Basically, we really don't have a choice, we have to go out have fun with leadership. It's supposed to be a morale boosting event, but when it's forced, it really isn't. Some of these events were BBQs, intra squadron challenges, 5k formation fun runs, and going away lunches. Of course during the holidays, the mandatory fun was kicked into overdrive with holiday potlucks, secret Santa gift exchanges, and crazy decoration contests. Around the summer of 2006, I was assigned to the Maintenance Control Center MCC office. This office had five people in it. Point one crusty E6, two career floating E5s, and two brand new E4s, I'm one of them. The thought of actually getting involved with mandatory fun events made the E5s and E6 cringe. They were set in their ways and absolutely hated squadron activities. Unfortunately for those guys, the MCC was located in the main squadron's building where all the squadron's leadership sat, and where all the other squadron's support officers were. Counting the commander's office and the commander's support staff office, there was a total of 15 different officers in that building. So if you didn't get involved in mandatory fun, it was noticed. Mid-November 2006, the squadron's party planning committee, can't remember their real name, had a great morale boosting idea, a door decorating contest. Each office in the squadron's main building will, keyword, will, decorate their door with a Christmas or holiday theme. The doors had to be completely decorated by the end of the second week of December. The committee would judge the doors on the beginning of the third week in December and announce the winners by the end of the week. The winners get a free lunch and bragging rights. As you walk through the building in the beginning of December, all the officers were going nuts with their door decos. One even had a Halloween Town Christmas theme that looked really cool. Another had projector pointing to the door showing snowflakes falling in great detail, and one had gift wrapped the entire door. All the officers, including the commander, had their doors decorated, except ours. When I asked the E6, aren't we gonna do something? His answer was, fuck no. I ain't doing that crap. Whereas the E5s were, we're busy, don't have time. It was Friday of the first week of December, and we still haven't decorated our door. 
The section chief E7 came in and asked the E6, are your guys going to decorate your door? The E6's answer was, no. We're busy training. Well, the section chief didn't like that answer and he told the whole MCC to do something creative by Cobb today, and then left. That's where I stepped up and used my young military experience. I remembered that during our last exercise, there were some signs that were posted around base that informed people of simulated a situation. Such as, simulated block door, or, simulated road hazard. With that knowledge in hand, I printed out four sheets of paper, taped one to the top, two in the middle, and one on bottom of the door. And that was our official door decorations, simulated lights, top, simulated ornaments, simulated wreath, middle, simulated snow, bottom. When section chief saw it, he came in and said, all right, who's the smart ass? We didn't end up winning the door contest, but someone from the wing PA office was in our building one day, saw our door, took a picture, and published it on the base paper with the caption, Holiday Spirit in full force, which the E6 absolutely hated because of the attention we got from it. The next one is titled, So you're saying I have to work all of Christmas. I was working in the oil industry in Europe, had a decent paying but difficult job. I was hired out to a large company and did all their work for a certain department. One day in late November I'm summoned to a meeting with the client and my employer. A new customer of the client is in dire need of equipment for a job due to ship mid to end of December. I assure them it's not an issue, takes two weeks maximum. Then they drop the bombshell, the materials for the job are in the USA and won't arrive until first week of December earliest. Delays happen and the materials arrive a few days before Christmas. I had no issue working during Christmas, and our client was asking very nicely if I would be able to get finished by the Monday after Christmas. I informed them of the hours required to complete the tasks, and they said, we don't care about the costs, just please get it done. After the meeting I was resigned to the fact I was working long days until it shipped. No issue for me, but my employer decided to turn the screws even harder and demands that I have to get it done, their reputation is on the line etc. They really really rubbed me the wrong way, I've always been a good employee and never once missed a delivery date. Once the job started everything that could go wrong basically went wrong. Employee no shows, broken equipment and tools, you name it. The end customer was breathing down my neck, but I knew I would be finished by deadline. Now most countries in Europe have very favorable holiday pay, this is no exception. I was paid the 24th, 25th and 26th whether or not I worked. But because I did work it counts as 2x overtime and I get the holiday pay on top. And if it's more than 8 hours it's 2 times pay again. So essentially 5x pay. I worked for almost two days straight to complete the job and the client was thrilled it was finished. They told me to take off the 27th with pay, but I still was being called all day by my employer and the end customer. Additionally there are strict rules about working too many hours here. So when I turned in my timesheet I filled it out with 26 hours a day for the three days I worked at 5x pay. I also charged 2x for the 27th although I was home. When my employer freaked out, I pointed out the laws we broke to get the job done, the way I was pushed and forced to meet an unrealistic deadline and how I was dealing with them, the client and end customer 24-7. They caved immediately and I made more in that weekend than the whole month. If they hadn't been so pushy I would have let them spread the hours out and pay me half that to avoid the drama. The next one is titled, I have to wrap all the Christmas presents myself? Okay, I'll make that known. When I was a kid, my dad could really be a dick sometimes. He broke rules all his life but would swiftly and gleefully punish me if I didn't do exactly what he wanted without question. Well one Christmas season we went out shopping for my mum and spent the whole day crawling the mall. When we got back home, he told me that I would be wrapping all the presents myself. You're not going to help me? No, I paid for them, you can wrap them. I was 12 years old, was I expected to buy presents? I knew better than to fight with him though so I did exactly what he asked. And when it came time to sign the from line on each presence tag, I wrote my name and my name alone. After all, if he was here, he could sign it. Heck, if he checked the presents before Christmas he could sign them. But of course, he didn't. And when we unwrapped presents my mum wondered out loud why every gift to her was from me. 
He got so mad and tried to make me feel bad about it. But when I explained it in front of both of them, he got quiet and stopped. From that point on, I had help wrapping each year. The last one is titled, The Christmas Tree is Too Big Inside? Okay, we will move it. My Bill is basically a Scrooge at Christmas time, and he got all pissed off when his daughter, my niece, wanted to decorate the house for Christmas, considering she lost her mother right before Thanksgiving last year, so I've been helping her set the tree up and decorate it. Well on Thursday I tripped over the extension cord that was powering the tree, and Bill got all upset because it was too big for the little living room we have, he was right, but still, so we decided to move it. It is now outside with the rest of our lights, and he just came outside and what could he say, we never said we were going to put it away, he just wrongly assumed that we were going to. He just walked away and said something about the lights would need to replace next year and went back inside. I should also point out that when we started decorating his only instruction was, don't go overboard, so we didn't, at least not inside. Thanks for listening.